Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Racing News 365.com podcast looking back at last weekend's spectacular Austrian Grand Prix and also looking ahead to this weekend's British Grand Prix, the final leg of the European triple header. From Racing News 365.com, my name is Nick Golding and I'm joined as always by 2023 Young Journalist of the Year, Sam Coop and Lead Editor Ian Parks. But before I start talking to the both of you, I'm going to begin by giving our audience a massive, massive thank you because over the Austrian Grand Prix weekend, RacingNews365.com on YouTube hit 5,000 subscribers. We've managed to achieve an extra 1K sub since the Monaco Grand Prix, and that is only possible thanks to you guys tuning into our videos and smashing that subscribe button. As well as that, this is also for those watching the podcast on YouTube, the 300th video on the channel. So let's make this one a special one, Sam and Ian. And what a talking point we have to start with. Max Verstappen, Lando Norris colliding whilst fighting for victory. Ian, this is a storyline now that is bubbling nicely. Yeah, I'm just going to obviously issue my vote of thanks as well to all those people that watch and comment because since Nick and I joined the website in February and we started doing these videos about a month, six weeks later or something like that, we've actually increased ourselves by 200% in going over the 5,000 threshold. So thank you ever so much. Keep watching, uh, keep commenting. Uh, we do obviously read nearly all your comments in the time that we have. So thank you ever so much for passing on those. And yes, let's get straight into it, Nick and Sam. What a weekend, what a remarkable weekend, because as you and I discussed in the update, Nick, it looked like it was going to be the perfect weekend for Max Verstappen. He'd already taken pole in both for the sprint and for the Grand Prix. He secured the sprint victory relatively comfortably, bar a, a minor challenge from Lando at one stage. But then that challenge from Lando turned into quite something else after that lap 51 pit stop for both guys, when Max had that seven and a half second cushion, looked like he was going to take the checkered flag at a relative canter. And then all of a sudden it kind of unraveled. Six and a half second stop, that pulled Lando back within touching distance. And of course, we saw then what unfolded over those quite dramatic few laps and what has led to quite a dramatic fallout as well with all and sundry offering their opinions, including us, including you guys watching as well. You know, we've been conducting a poll on our website as to who was in the wrong. Uh, we've had over 50,000 votes on that. That is quite something for a poll on our website, I've got to say. So thank you to everyone that's also polling there as well. And the overwhelming majority, 70% siding with the stewards, who obviously issued a 10 second penalty for causing a collision to Max Verstappen. So 70% of those 50,000 of you that have voted saying, yes, Max was in the wrong, just an 8% saying Lando. I'd like to know how those people are viewing that incident. Uh, give us your comments. If you're a Lando, if you feel Lando was in the wrong, I'd like to know what, what makes you think Lando was in the wrong. And then obviously the remaining 22% or so saying it was a racing incident. I can understand that to a certain extent, but when you really dig deep into that incident uh, with Max, um, as I said, you know, post-race, Nick, uh, for me, Max was at fault. Sam, you're up next, mate. What do you think? Well, I'll be honest. When I first saw it, I did think that's a racing incident, but it's the helicopter cam where you can really see the drifting over in the braking zone. And... Maybe it's using your know, kind of past experience to kind of inform what, what's kind of happening in the present. But Max has two calling cards when it comes to his kind of aggressive wheel to wheel style, especially when the kind of pressure is really on. One of them is that kind of that block or more, almost parking wide of the apex, blocking off the, the other car. But the, the, the main one and what we saw yesterday is that moving under braking? It has is it was long an issue in his 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 earlier F1 career. Mm. We haven't seen it of late, but I think that's because he hasn't been battled and, and, and raced as hard. But this was very reminiscent of 2021 in many ways. I think they're fair comparisons. We've heard them from you know the likes of Andrea Stella, from from the likes of 
pundits on Sky that it just feels a little bit kind of like, like a bit of deja vu in that sense. I think we'd kind of thought he'd moved on from that. But I guess, you know, kind of old habits die hard to a certain extent. But yeah, I, I, I think it is, if you're going to portion blame, I think it's definitely with Max. I think the penalty was fair. I also think it's important to not let the ends kind of dictate the means with with penalties. I think often we, like, you know, take the cops incident from, from 2021. How large that accident became, or, or ended up being, and yes, it's a very dangerous corner. I think is part of the reason why people were so dissatisfied with Lewis's 10 second penalty that day. And I think this is a case here where I think 10 seconds was fair. Yes, it ruined Lando's race, but let's actually look at the the substance of what Max did. It wasn't warranting anything more severe than that. I think the stewards got that right. Okay, so it's two, it's two against one then, because I still think race since. And I think in the build up to it, you know, it, it all started on that 55 with, you know, both of them perhaps trying some over ambitious moves. Both of them were off the circuit at some point. It was, it all just felt like it was bubbling up to an eventual collision, which of course then happened on lap 64. The Austrian Grand Prix, though, as a whole, just had stories everywhere you looked. Friday, the big story was Jos Verstappen and Christian Horner. Saturday, the big story was Oscar Piastri having his lap time in qualifying, which would have been good enough for third, deleted for exceeding track limits. And obviously on Sunday, Norris and Verstappen resulting in a George Russell win. But we'll talk about Russell in a second. Ian, we spoke about obviously Verstappen's and Norris's friendship. But when you look at and I was thinking about this on, on the flight back from Eindhoven. I'm no longer in Holland, uh, quite clearly, the Netherlands. When you look into this and what happened, whilst we've had some, you know, some big crashes over the last couple of years, in terms of on-track collisions in, in the form of a duel, is this the biggest moment we've had since 2021? And the reason I say that is obviously, as Sam pointed out, post-race, McLaren team principal Andrea Stella actually did bring up 2020, 2021 and in particular, the Brazilian Grand Prix? It's certainly the most significant moment, I think, since 2021, simply because 2022 and 2023 were so dominated by Max that he barely had to put up a fight worthy of that particular word uh, throughout those two years. Um, So this, for me, bearing in mind the pressure that he has been coming under Since the Miami Grand Prix of this year, when McLaren brought this major upgrade and it really thrust itself back towards the front of the grid after Red Bull and Max had again pretty much dominated the first few Grand Prix. Obviously, Max had that issue in Australia that led to an early retirement. But other than that, as I say, he he was looking as if it was going to be another relative canter. So since Miami, yes, he's come under major threat. Not only from uh, McLaren and Lando, but obviously Monaco, as we know, that car not good at curb riding and the bumps, and it really struggled. And he and Red Bull were most definitely on the back foot there. Ferrari, Charles Leclerc came through and won that Grand Prix. Canada again, uh, there was a real big opportunity for George Russell and Mercedes, as we well know, and just simply great tactics, great driving from Max throughout that race led to him getting a victory that arguably he shouldn't have had. And then obviously over the weekend, it appeared as if he was back to his all conquering dominant best, as I say, uh, good qualifying performance for the sprint, just as I called it on Saturday evening, just arguably one of the most perfect qualifying performances that I've seen Throughout, certainly throughout my career, the way he just got quicker and quicker and quicker and demolished the opposition around the shortest lap in Formula One in terms of time to have a four tenths of a second cushion around a 64 second lap is just extraordinary. And then, as I say, for the first 51 laps of the Grand Prix, it looked like it was his for the taking and it would have completed the perfect weekend for him. But now, All of a sudden, as I say, because of that unfortunate situation with regard to the removal of the left rear wheel on his Red Bull, it brought Lando back into play. 
and we had this great battle. We, we've always known that Lando's been there in the mix, challenging, fighting. And he was in the mix on this occasion, but just that the Red Bull had that greater degree of pace. And that's why he Max had been able to open up that seven and a half second cushion going into those lap 51 pit stops. And then as we saw, everything changed, but it's now going to be what should be a fascinating battle at Silverstone this weekend, because we know how good that McLaren is around there. We've, we've seen it in the past, uh, certainly last year. Look at what uh, Lando and Oscar did in that particular Grand Prix. So it, it's going to be another wonderful head-to-head. -head. And if those two are dicing again on the same piece of asphalt around Silverstone, who knows how it's going to materialise. Hopefully not another Lewis and Max incident from 2021, as Sam referenced earlier. But certainly 2021 has definitely been referenced by Andrea Stella and the fact that surely we need to be looking at situations like this in a bit more depth now. Absolutely. And of course, uh, quickly looking ahead to Silverstone, the British Grand Prix, and in terms of Max and Lando. Sam, something that Lando picked out after the sprint race where again him and Max jostled uh, for the lead. Lando picked out that he made a mistake when trying to overtake Max. And obviously, he kind of tried a similar move in the main race on Sunday. Looking ahead to Silverstone, do you think Lando has learned from his mistakes and now has a better understanding of how to, you know, fight Max? Because as pointed out by our viewers in after the F1 update on Sunday, you have to race Max a certain way because of his driving style and obviously, you know, because he is so clever at defending. Absolutely. Um, this might sound like a, an odd kind of way of describing this, but you know how we, growing up, you're told that with, with horses, you can't show that you're scared. They'll sense the no. fear. <laughs> I think, okay, well, yeah, maybe, yeah. <laughs> I'm a town boy. So yeah, maybe, maybe. Point. I have actually heard that before. So yeah. Yeah. That's okay. my age show. That's no more okay. <laughs> But either way, the, it's the idea that they can, that the Max can sense hesitation or weakness, or he knows when he's going up against someone who maybe is not quite appreciating his, the, the lengths he will go to to defend a position. And I, I caveat that caveat this by saying that that is more often than not absolutely fair and within the, the, the rules and the confines um, afforded the drivers. But he likes hard racing and he's very, very good at defending. I think with Lando, there was a bit of naivety over the weekend in battling Max. I think he almost thought he would be afforded more courtesy than than he was from Max. And it's almost this kind of like, you know, welcome to the NFL moment. It's like, you know, this is the big leagues now. You're up against a triple world champion who himself dethroned a seven-time world champion. Max doesn't mess around. And any friendship, that doesn't matter when you're on track. And that's what we saw over the weekend. Yeah, absolutely. Lando kind of was aware that, yeah, I made this amateur mistake, as he called it. Um, But then he didn't, and me immediately kind of jump on that on Sunday. What I was impressed with and what I think will then hold him in good stead moving forward and into Silverstone, I think he's kind of learned. Uh, and from what he said, it sounds like he he's learned from after the race on Sunday, he was completely unapologetic. He was like, Oh, there's nothing for me to change. I did nothing wrong. There, it was just completely, he, he knew exactly how things were. He knew that he was the, on the side of public opinion he knew he was on the side of the stewards. And I think going forward, he won't be quite as forgiving, or maybe he'll be a little bit more savvy in how he attacks Max. Looking back on, on that, could he maybe have held off for a couple more laps? Really got himself into a position where he was really comfortable. We saw a kind of, I don't think desperate is a fair word, but we saw a dive bomb, which Max himself actually did take exception to. So we saw that there was almost this kind of, over urgency to get the move done. I just, I just need to do it. I need to seize any opportunity. I think we'll see Lando be more methodical, more calculating moving forward. And I think that will 
put him in a, a better position to to fight Max if we're going to have this rivalry long term. Absolutely. And just very quickly before we move on to the driver who kind of inherited victory, you know, I guess to his disbelief as well. Do you think this is good for F1 as a show? Because obviously in 2023, you know, we saw Red Bull and Max Verstappen dominance. You know, it was perhaps one of the greatest performances across a season F1 has ever seen. But of course it did, you know, impact fans interest at times now that we've got what looks like maybe not a title fight because Verstappen just seems to still be stronger and obviously we know that Red Bull when it's working it is in a league of its own but do you think this is having you know a duel that now has has now run over the past five six races is this good for the show aspect of F1 Ian? It will have reignited uh, the passion yeah. certainly um Within your casual fan, never mind if you're a fan of Max Verstappen, Lando Norris, Red Bull or McLaren, because for two years we've seen Max dominate. And we know through any period of domination that a certain level of interest starts to decline uh, amongst fans. We saw the same with Lewis. I mean, yeah, exactly. You know, I'm, I'm just going to reference my next door neighbour and he's a massive Formula One fan. Big petrol. Is he a... Is he a horse? I'm going to move swiftly on from that comment, I think. <laughs> uh, oh, God. <laughs> I think you know where I was going with that. Yeah, yeah. I just, I'm going to move swiftly on. Maybe we might just cut that little section out of this <laughs> video as well when it goes live. But he's a massive, massive Formula One fan, big petrol head. But even he himself, and he's admitted it through the Mercedes era as well, he started to lose a bit, a bit of interest. You know, he, he wouldn't watch an entire Grand Prix because he kind of knew what the finish was going to be. He felt the same during those two years of Max's dominance. It was starting to get boring and stayed, you know. And I'm obviously talking from a guy that is just a general casual fan. He doesn't have an affiliation to any driver or any particular team. He just loves Formula One for what it provides him in terms of entertainment and on-track racing. Now, I spoke to him before this weekend, I actually just had a quick chat with him and I said to him, are you enjoying F1 again? And he said he's absolutely loving it. So hes I know it's just a sample of one, but if that sample of one, you think of the global picture and without a shadow of a doubt, what these two guys are doing on track right now, even if, as you've pointed out, Nick, Max has quite a considerable gap in the driver's championship. Yeah. If we're going to get that weekend in, weekend out for the rest of the season, then that's going to, you know, keep the juices flowing, keep the fans engaged. And, you know, we're going to really enjoy, as we are now, discussing Formula One. You know, this is our bread and butter. This is our nuts and bolts. And this is what we love doing when we have situations like this, two drivers going at it hammer and tongs and from two different teams as well yeah. yeah it was great with the intra-team rivalry when we had lewis and nico in particular at mercedes but when it's two drivers from two different teams obviously running two different cars that's where the real intrigue comes from and i think that's one what is what is going to hold our interest for the remainder of this season even if max does go on and win a fourth driver's time that's a really good point actually you make about the fact of the significance when it's two drivers from two different teams because it creates a rivalry in a show not just between the drivers but actually between those higher up in the team we'll see look at christian horner and toto wolf who despite the fact mercedes i know they won us so we'll get onto them next despite the fact mercedes haven't really been on red bull's level the last few years there's still that you know displeasure between wolf and horner but let's talk about George Russell, who of course was third for pretty much the entire race until the incident inherited victory. Although he almost didn't win because of a what an embarrassing moment, as Toto Wolff has, has put it himself. A radio message. You can tell it's been a while since Mercedes won Sam because Toto got a little bit excited over the radio. He, he <laughs> certainly did. Um, so, so what happened? If, if you haven't uh, heard or, or Go and read watch about it. it is yes absolutely there's we've covered it uh on on the website um but when it became apparent that there were there were punctures for both lando and max upon being told that that was the case you then over george's team radio you hear 
you hear Toto go, George, you can win this. You can win this, George. And he just he yells it. But the timing of doing so, it was, I think it was the, in the breaking zone of turn three. It was, it was basically a really critical point of the track where you don't, you don't disturb a driver. It's a golden rule in F1. You only speak to your driver really when they're on a straight, when they're at a lower capacity, there's lower capacity in terms of what they're doing. They don't have to focus on, you know, driving, you know, cornering, braking, whatever it might be. And so George then come, comes out and just wants, just let me effing drive. <laughs> and Toto afterwards brilliantly kind of said that it's the the most, it's the most shame. He said he's ashamed. He said it was the the most. What was, the, what was the word he used? It was embarrassed. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and he just basically said that it's the yeah uh, the the silliest thing that he's done in twelve years of being a team principal, um, and he really kind of really admonished himself for it. He was very very um, stern, and I mean credit to him for being so open and honest about it because he could have just really not made it much of a thing. Um, but yeah, absolutely brilliant moment. And it, but it just as you kind of alluded to. Nick, it just shows how much that means to a team that has won eight constructor titles in the last decade. That they've gone a couple of years without a winning. I think it was five hundred ninety-five days. The excitement from Toto Wolff, who's they've won what hunt, over a hundred races in in that period, and yet that it's been so long that 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 hunger, that desire, is still burning bright. So yeah, really, really. Fun moment, but it kind of cuts to just how much these guys want this. And so, yeah, a, a, a popular win, I feel, uh, across the paddock. Yeah, abs- the word was ashamed, ashamed that he used. I've just quickly checked and used the word ashamed. I'm almost, is that even even worse than, than, he, than his, uh, <laughs> no, Mikey, no, <laughs> comment that he did during the Abu Dhabi 2021 Grand Prix, of course, when he was trying to get the then race director to what on earth are you doing kind of decision, you know, from back then. Sorry for the, uh, for the <laughs> impression there. It was also, he also referred to it as the, it was the single dumbest thing he'd done is what he said uh, as well. So yeah, I mean, multiple, very, very interesting quotes from Toto. There. Two Toto Wolf impersonations. I do promise we are a serious Formula One podcast. Ian though, it just, the, the, the whole shock. <laughs> really? The whole, <laughs> the whole, we've spoken about horses already so far today as well, but, the Mercedes, the whole shock amongst the team and, and the way Toto, you know, almost so surprised, jumped onto the radio, kind of shows a little bit where Mercedes are in that they were never expecting to win. Toto said himself that, you know, George was third on the road and actually that's kind of where they, you know, predicted yeah. the best would be. How significant a moment is this for Mercedes? Because, you know, they've gotten this win finally under their belt, ended this winless streak Looking forward as well to, to the British Grand Prix, you know, for Russ, obviously for Lewis, who had a, a difficult weekend. This feels like potentially, you know, turning of the tides almost, despite the fact they didn't have anywhere near the fastest car. Yeah, for, for George in particular, yeah. he felt it made up for what happened in Canada. He, he knew in particular that that was a really golden opportunity for him to win that race. And of course, he made two mistakes in it that were obviously quite costly. So this was almost kind of like a bit of a Christmas come early for him, but most definitely a little bit of redemption as well in securing the win, even if it came obviously in very fortuitous circumstances. But a win is a win. You've got to be in it to win it. You've got to be there at the checkered flag. Choose whatever phrase that you want to, to sum it all yeah, up. Yeah, but do in Georgia he was there. Exactly. And... It was right moment, right time, and he he mopped up from you know the clash between Max and Lando. Yeah. So in terms of Mercedes, um, they're still not quite there. We we know that they've been getting closer and closer because they've been introducing upgrade after upgrade after upgrade after every single race, and we're expecting more for the British Grand Prix. Will that edge them closer? Obviously, we don't know. They're going to be hoping that's going to be the case, but it is their home race. They're just around the corner. Very similar, of course, to McLaren and Red Bull, a second home race for Red Bull, of course, back to back. We know Red Bull's got upgrades coming for the British Grand Prix. 
so that's going to be interesting to look at to see what they're going to bring to that car and how much is that going to propel them further forward because let's face it max dominated austria putting to one side that collision with lando he absolutely thoroughly crushed it over that grand prix weekend and as i say that pole performance uh, in qualifying on saturday afternoon was just magnificent is that going to carry itself through to silverstone and a much longer lap you know if that's the case then we could be looking at something like seven to eight tenths of a second i'm not saying that's going to be the case i'm just hypothesizing here but as i say they've got an upgrade coming mercedes has got more parts mclaren almost certainly will wheel out a few more bits as well with this being their home race ferrari need to get back on the pace because they've fallen off all of a sudden since since monaco and their performance there so it should be overall a really fascinating tussle between those four teams if in particular ferrari can get back amongst it because without a shadow of doubt they've fallen back now to the fourth quickest team behind mclaren and red bull and mercedes absolutely and i guess ferrari were another team who kind of you know in, inherited a podium effectively through carlos Sainz finishing third through lando's and max's crash or as carlos Sainz would probably put it it was a ding dong which ended in quite a big dong but one that mercedes and ferrari are probably quite fortunate about Let, let's talk about carlos Sainz a little bit because he finished third and said some very interesting things in the press conference after the race we know of course he is still yet to make a decision on who he will drive for for 2025 we know that the three teams very much interested are williams audi of stake f1 and alpine however there's been some speculation that you know the teams who are wanting carlos are starting to get a bit a, a bit impatient and when this was put to you know the spaniard he's very much still insistent it is his decision he will take as much time as he wants do you think he, he's taking too long now though given that actually he is the most wanted driver on the driver market available and when he decides where he will join it is going to have such a big impact on several other careers of drivers who are also in need of a seat for next season go for it sam it's it's, it's a tricky one because carlos is obviously very, very smart and he must know that the market won't wait forever. But there does seem to, and this is kind of putting, you know, putting the pieces together and kind of looking at kind of how, what it implies. But it feels a little bit like he does think that, you know, I the, the balls in my court, I, I can take as, long, as much time as I want. There's almost a level of kind of taking it for granted almost. And what we're starting to hear is that teams, and it sounds like from what we can, again, piece together, Williams is starting to get a little bit kind of like, okay, we want to move now. We want to kind of get on with this. What impact that has on, say, Esteban Ocon, who, you know, what we're hearing is his position is becoming increasingly strong within the market as those teams are starting to tire of waiting for Carlos Sainz. And they kind of think, you know what, Uh, we can't lose out on the second option if our first option is taking too long and then decides to go somewhere else, because then we're left, you know, basically with, with an option we didn't really expect to have to fall to again with, with those drives, Ocon and Bottas as well, very much key in the market. Ocon has said that he's had two, you know, serious talks um, with teams. So, you know, putting that together, that's, you know, we know that's Haas. At first, I kind of thought that might be Audi. I think it's probably actually Williams. And Valtteri Bottas as well cut a bit of a frustrated figure on Thursday in Austria, kind of saying that I was hoping for some news this week, but there was delays on that. And that, you've got to assume, is delays on Williams announcing science. And is that because Alpine has now got into the mix? So it's it's multifaceted here. There's so many different moving parts. It's a very dynamic situation. But yeah, there is the sense that Carlos Sainz is now starting to... We know that he was delaying the market. I think it, the market is now starting to turn against him where he's going to have to make a choice. He, the cards are laid out. They're not going to change. Nothing. There's no new information coming. He just needs to make that decision. And I don't know what the, the benefit of delaying is at this stage. Ian, your thoughts? And that's, yeah, that, that's the thing. We've discussed Carlos on this show previously. <laughs> and you can only appreciate this, the, the dilemma that 
he's facing because he's driving for a top team. He's lost his seat in a top team when, for all intents and purposes, he's never really done anything wrong to warrant being axed from a top team. You know, we see drivers come and go and a lot of drivers lose their seats because they've not really performed. Esteban knock on at uh, Alpine, for argument's sake. You know, as far in Alpine's eyes, he's not really lived up to the billing that they were hoping for. And obviously that clash in Monaco that he had with his teammate Pierre Gasly was the straw that broke the camel's back for team principal Bruno Fanny. Obviously then the Red Bull option disappeared. Mercedes ruled themselves out of the running in terms of tying in Carlos because they want to go down a different route and they've got different things in mind with regards to how they want to line up over the coming few years. So all of a sudden, Carlos has gone from this front-running team challenging for victories, and he's won a couple of races with Ferrari, as we know, definitely challenging for podiums, as we saw on Sunday in Austria, got another one. And all of a sudden, he's faced with these options. It's like, where am I going to go? He's got Williams on one side, making great strides, as we know, under James Valls in terms of its infrastructure, trying to get back towards the front of the grid. Owners Donaldson Capital putting in a considerable amount of money to try and get that team back up the grid. But with a great power unit partner as well in Mercedes, they look relatively strong for 2026. Then we've got Audi. And who knows what Audi is going to produce? Who knows how long it's going to take for a team that, OK, has the infrastructure behind it with Sauber, but it's a brand new power unit manufacturer coming into the sport. And we saw how long it took Honda when it returned to the sport uh, in the current power unit area back in 2015. It was a year delayed, obviously, before it came online. But nevertheless, it took that manufacturer an awful long time to finally catch up. And then we've got the Alpine situation and the stories that we're hearing that Renault is going to pull out as its power unit supplier and that therefore leaves the Alpine team as an entity without Renault, but trying to then drag on board or lure in another power unit partner. So he's got these three different options and it's like the devil in the deep blue sea and then something else in terms of where do I go? Who do I choose? And it's no wonder he's taking so long to come up with a decision because it's just like, He's got no real idea as to which of those three options is going to be coming or going into 2026 and challenging for what he hopes is going to be a, not potentially not really, I don't think titles, not really, I don't think wins, maybe not even podiums, but certainly just decent points. That's what he's looking at here. And then out of 2026, which one of those three teams has the better prospects for then challenging for those greater points, those podiums, eventually maybe even race wins. It's a real, real dilemma. I wouldn't want to be in his shoes, to be yeah. honest, apart from the fact that he's going to get, as I've mentioned previously, a very sizable pay packet. But that's not the be all and end all of what an F1 driver wants is, is the paycheck at the end of the day. He wants to be challenging for those podiums he wants those race wins that Carlos has had that he's deserved over these few years that he's had with Ferrari and I suppose the difficult thing as well is that regardless of how big the paycheck is going to be it's except to the fact that no matter who he chooses out of the options he has he's going to go backwards in you know the pecking order he's not going to be fighting for necessarily points every race you know the three teams he's linked with none of them have been well out been the best recently but none have been across the season so far regular point finishes one driver though who was towards the bottom of the points in austria and we talk about him a lot and we obviously give him a fair bit of stick at times given that max verstappen is performing so well sergio perez it wouldn't be a, an episode without talking about the red bull driver finished in seventh last weekend a, another really difficult weekend given that he finished two places behind Max behind Nico Hulkenberg as well you know it wasn't there to capitalize on Lando and Max colliding unlike 
George Russell, Oscar Piastri finished second and Carlos Sainz. However, on this occasion, Sam, Sergio does have a pretty good excuse for not being at the sharp end, given what happened on the first lap. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think it's it's one of those kind of boy who cried wolf situations with Sergio. It's very easy to go, oh, well, he's seventh. Yeah, he's underperforming. But actually what happened in Austria on lap one was yeah, that, that clash with Oscar Piastri on the outside of turn four. And that resulted in... I was going to say kind of a, a you know, cut in his side pod, but it was a huge chunk. It was chunk. a wound. Like, a, a, yeah, it was a, like a, a huge hole in the side of his car. Um, and that was obviously really, really affecting his, his performance, the RB20's performance. He was nursing that car. It was, it was a wounded car uh, for all intents and purposes. And he was just holding on. And he, he said after the race that he had no hope of fighting, that, you know, there was there was nothing more he could do. And yeah, so on the face of it, you know, being between the Hasses looks pretty bad. Finishing behind your teammate who's spent one lap on three tyres um, and give, being given a 10 second time penalty. So yeah, it does look awful, but this is why you can't merely look at the results. You've got to also look at the report or actually watch. Um yeah, I think it's it's always difficult to sell because he also did, up until that point, have a another slightly kind of off-colour weekend. He just didn't really look in the mix. And that's that that's the difficult thing, is that when he does now have these legitimately difficult races, as we saw yesterday, it's very easy to then fall back on. And I saw you both laugh as soon as I said that, uh, that he'd had a difficult weekend up until that point. But yeah, I think it, it really is a case where I think we need to kind of actually appreciate that he did a pretty good job to even bring that car home in yeah. points. Um, I think there are you know lots of other drivers who wouldn't have managed that. So credit where credit is due. Um, he's got the most out of that race uh, for from what we can Absolutely. see. Absolutely, Ian. Off, off color is an understatement. Um, I'm going to give that, him, okay. Is I'm that why him, you're laughing? Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, because he used the word off color. I'm going to give him a degree of credit for what he achieved in the Grand Prix. However, Max Verstappen, as we have discussed, grabbed pole position by four tenths of a second over his nearest rival. If Max Verstappen had a teammate that was performing well was had a grasp of what that car could do and what that car can achieve then without a shadow of a doubt that would have been an all red bull front row on sunday and therefore checo would have been in the prime position most likely to have capitalized on any kind of incident, if everything had unfolded, et cetera, et cetera, between Max and Lando. As I say, it, the whole set of circumstances need to play into that. If Checo had been on the front row, of course, would he have been able to have challenged Max? Who knows? But he wasn't. He was back down the grid where he shouldn't have been in that car that has proven itself time and time again at the hands of Max Verstappen. The curious thing for me about Checo Perez is some comments from Christian Horner over the weekend on Sky Sports F1. As we know, Checo early this season, just before things started to unravel for him again, as they have done, signed a one plus one deal, 25 plus 26. I'm now wondering, given certain comments from Christian, whether there might be an escape clause on Red Bull's side, given the way Checo is underperforming. Because Christian Horner turned around and basically said that Checo deserved that contract on the basis of his contribution to the team, in particular last season when he managed to finish second in the Drivers' Championship, even though, as we know, the number of points accrued by Max Verstappen over the course of last season was enough for Red Bull to have won the title constructors title on its own but he's made clear that regardless of 
a contract, there is always pressure to perform on a driver. And that right now, that pressure is being applied on Checo Perez. Christian Horner turned around and said, it's a pressure business. And Checo knows that he is under scrutiny. And as I say, it doesn't matter that level of scrutiny, that level of pressure, the contract is irrelevant. And I thought that was a really pertinent comment. And that has really made me wonder, could Red Bull, depending on what's in that contract, ask Checo Perez at some point, either this season or at the end of it, and that one plus one deal just basically goes out the window? I'm really curious because I just thought it was a very, very unusual comment for Christian to make because normally contracts are relatively quite tight on the driver's side. The more weighted towards the driver's side, the more he, you know, a driver like Max, for argument's sake, has an escape clause in his contract. So we're led to believe that he can go if Helmut Marco goes before him then Max can follow Helmut out the door at Red Bull. That's why we have all this Mercedes speculation at the moment as to whether Max might go there in 26. So I'm now really wondering, is there something now weighted on Red Bull's side in this new Checo Perez contract, given the way he's performing at the moment? Yeah, completely. I mean, just Sorry, Nick, if I could just add, add some more into that. I think it's, yeah, in the wording as well, like, you know, kind of, I, I imagine people might kind of say, oh, well, that's Ian's view that he's underperforming. Well, it's actually Christian Horner's view as well. He, he, in those comments did also say when you have a driver who is under delivering, yeah. which is, yeah. So, and that again, in the context of then talking about contracts, that it does very much point to performance based incentives where if he's not reaching those, actually we do have an escape route as, as you absolutely say it. And Red Bull, in the cost of, of of having Max Verstappen and how dominant Max Verstappen is, they generally the, the 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 kind of the rule of thumb that's kind of spoken about amongst the paddock is that they are happy for his teammate to be about three tenths per lap from Max. Sergio is far off that at the moment. And we've got to a point now, now that McLaren Mercedes and Ferrari have started to fill that void between Max and and, and Sergio. Out of those eight drivers in those top four teams, Sergio is comfortably eighth place. We saw that all weekend in terms of where he was where he was qualifying where, and where he was performing. So, yeah, there's. I I wouldn't be surprised if maybe not an axing outright, but changes within the Red Bull family certainly. Definitely, and the, oh, and the key here as well. I'm just going to yeah, very go briefly add. Sorry, now. yeah, very very briefly, and the key here as well is the constructors' championship. Yeah. Right now, Max Verstappen is not winning the Constructors' Championship on his own, as he did for Red Bull last year. Red Bull is very much in a Constructors' title fight this season. It needs its second driver on this year because it is coming under so much threat from McLaren, Mercedes and Ferrari, whoever it might be on any given Grand Prix weekend. Nevertheless, those three teams are definitely, well, certainly McLaren and, and Ferrari. Mercedes is going to be too far back right now. Yes, it's coming with a bit of a challenge, but too far back to challenge Red Bull. But without a shadow of a doubt, Red Bull's lead over Ferrari right now is only 64 points. So without a shadow of a doubt, Red Bull is in a fight for the Constructors title that it won so at a canter last year. And it needs Checo Perez on this occasion to start delivering to retain its Constructors title. That's why... I've drawn the reference to Horner's comments uh, with regard to that basically contracts are irrelevant in such situations like this. And I'm wondering just how relevant Checo Perez's contract is, because as Horner pointed out, he is under delivering. Absolutely. And of course, for those who are watching this podcast on YouTube, let us know your thoughts on all the talking points so far in the comment section below. And just finally to wrap up, this episode of the racing news 365.com podcast we of course need to do our biggest takeaway from the austrian grand prix and a bold prediction for the british grand prix and i will give you guys a few seconds to think so i will kick things off my big takeaway from the austrian grand prix is that whilst i don't think we've got a title fight but i think what we do have now 
is very much a fascinating storyline between Max and Lando, which we've perhaps been lacking in F1, really probably since Lewis and Max's season-long duel in 2021. And my bold prediction for the British Grand Prix, apart from it probably being cold, miserable and wet, is that I reckon Oscar Piastri is going to have better pace than Lando Norris. Sam, over to you. I mean that's 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 a really that's a really nice prediction. Thank you. And I which one the weather? I, I, I mean <laughs> that's not so nice. Uh, I don't think any of us want, want that prediction. But yeah, I think you're probably actually you know doing a pretty good Michael Fish impression there. I think yeah, you're pr- pr- pretty right on with your uh, weather. Um, I think that we are going to see very in very quick succession, mind part two of what will develop into potentially quite a fierce rivalry between Lando and Max. There's something about that friends to foe narrative that really kind of cuts uh, deep and really you know, gets people invested. And I think we will see a really hard battle between the two of them this weekend. Whether or not it will ultimately come to blows and who prevails, I think that remains to be seen. But I think this is going to be the establishment of that. If last weekend was the catalyst, this was what will set the tone moving forward at Silverstone. Ian. Uh, just on the weather forecast, it's actually not looking too bad. Um, <laughs> we look like we're gonna. It's going to be a bit overcast. Um, temperatures about eighteen, nineteen, so not that bad. But it's there's no rain forecast at this stage, and we are recording this uh, in the early part of the week just to let people know. So we're a few days away from the British Grand Prix as I say this. Um, biggest takeaway: you've you've actually stolen it, uh, to be honest. Uh, Thank Nick. you very much. Um, because <laughs> I was pretty much going to go along the same lines as soon as you mentioned that, that I think now we have a real battle on our hands. I think the biggest thing for me is what has this done for Max and Lando's friendship? Yeah. As we discussed on F1 Update on Sunday night post-race, uh, we know those two guys um, are good friends. Um, they go out together. They engage in sim racing together. And Lando made it quite clear Uh, in his comments post-race, where he said that um, he would lose a bit of respect for Max to a certain extent if Max didn't at least come out and hold his hands up and say, yeah, okay, that was my fault on this occasion. Well, Max has had a few opportunities um, and he hasn't yet done so. Uh, He didn't do so in the immediate aftermath and he didn't do so again in a quite interesting Instagram post where he on the Red Bull Racing uh, Instagram page where he was asked just to give his thoughts and he basically just turned around and said oh it was just one of those things really you know it was uh, as I say didn't hold his hands up to it so he's not in that particular one okay it's on a Red Bull Racing Instagram post so you wouldn't expect him to maybe apologize on that will he do so privately with Lando because Max most definitely indicated that they would at least talk things through. So we will see what comes out of that. I'm convinced that their friendship will be okay, but what will be the consequences of that friendship when they do have another incident? And right now, given how closely matched they are, pounds to a penny, there will be another incident at some stage between them, if not more than one. And it's going to be interesting to see the battle that comes out of that, the on-track battle that comes out of that. And if there is another race-defining incident between them, what will be the consequences of that friendship? Because when you are rivals fighting for Grand, certainly Grand Prix victories as they are right now, less so the title, between, given the gap between Max and Lando, can you really be friends, but also rivals? Very, very difficult, as we've seen in the past in Formula One. Absolutely. And I think on that note, it brings an end to the latest episode of the Racing News 365.com podcast. For those watching on YouTube, as always, anything we've discussed, you have thoughts on, let us know in the comment section below. And again, if you are watching on YouTube, be sure to smash a like on this podcast. Subscribe to the channel, especially as our prize giveaway for a scale model F1 car is still 
going and thank you once again for 5,000 subscribers. Here's to 10K. From myself, Ian, and Sam, this has been the latest episode of the Racing News 365.com podcast. We will see you this weekend for the British Grand Prix. See you later. And as always, take care, folks. Bye, guys.